Hello and welcome to Engineering Economy. This is Dr. Alec Hammerdiner. This is uh, part two of lecture two on engineering costs and cost estimating. And in part two, we will talk about cost estimating methods. Let's go ahead and get started talking about cost estimating. Estimating is a foundation of economic analysis. Without the um, proper estimates, the economic analysis, the results of economic analysis could be misleading. So types of cost estimating exist. Um, there is actually three different types and they are uh, vary, they vary based on accuracy. Um, specifically, you could get rough ex estimates and rough estimates have error between um, minus 30% to plus 60%. Also, semi-detailed estimates um, where the error is between negative 15% to uh, plus 20%. And detailed estimates where the error is um, from minus 3% to plus 5%. So as you can see, there is this tendency to uh, underestimate costs and so you can see that there is a larger um, error in terms of the cost might be um, if you're doing for example rough estimates might be 60% uh, larger than what you estimated so it's important to understand the trade-off between accuracy and cost of estimation so the cost of estimate can be very low but then, of course, the accuracy is also low. Um, when the, we want to achieve a medium accuracy, we can actually achieve it at a, a relatively, still relatively low cost. But the high accuracy estimates also require uh, high costs because you need to already be able to understand different designs and, and be able to uh, have a design a detailed design for the project. So there are difficulties in estimation. Specifically, you might be required to um, have a one-of-a-kind estimate uh, where you haven't done this before and there haven't been anything where you, you did something similar where you can use it to um, as a basis, as a basis for your estimate, so you might have to deal with one of the kind of estimates, which is a very difficult um, issue in terms of estimating costs. There are also limitations in terms of the time and effort available. You might not have the expertise, um, the best uh, type of expertise, or you might not have enough people to work on a cost estimation, or you might just have to. Um, do a very quick estimate uh, that doesn't allow you to um, do a, a detailed estimation because it would require more time. And of course, estimator expertise. Um, so again, right, if you don't have uh, enough expertise, um, that might limit the type of estimates that you can produce. So there are different categories of cost estimation, um, in particular capital investment, and that includes shipping and handling, handling, installation, and training. Another category is labor cost, and that includes direct and indirect labor cost. Also material cost, which also could be direct and indirect. Maintenance cost, uh, which include the regular and overhaul maintenance. Um, so of course, you know, regular maintenance is some things that's planned and overhaul it, um, is something that is not planned and um, when you notice that something does need maintenance um, that not is typically done then that would be an example of overhaul uh, maintenance uh, another category of costs is property taxes and insurance right you not always know um, how much your property taxes are going to be because they might change um, during the next year. So again, property taxes and insurance and insurance can um, change as well depending on some events that happened previous year. So um, 
and you need to estimate those costs as well. Uh, operating costs, for example, rental, gas, and electricity, they go into uh, operating costs. Quality costs for scrap, rework, and inspection. Um, another category of cost estimation is overhead costs, and that includes administration and sales, and also disposal costs, that's another category. Um, then we have revenue costs, um, sometimes uh, there is cost associated with revenues. Um, market values, that's another uh, category of cost estimation. So where do we get uh, the data to estimate cost? What are the sources of cost estimating data? Well, we can look into accounting records. We can also look into other sources within the firm. Uh, for example, engineering, production, quality, or we can look into sales, purchasing, and personnel. Um, there is also published information that's available, for example, statistical abstracts of U.S. that includes cost indices or monthly labor review. That's where you get labor costs. Um, other uh, source of published information is building construction cost data. Um, and then there's other sources outside of the firm that includes vendors and salespeople. Another important uh, source is research and development. Uh, for example, a pilot plant. Uh, of course, it might not be exactly the same like the plan that will be built, um, but you can have a pilot plant constructed, you can have test market, uh, again, research and development is more expensive um, sources. Um, so again, test market is another thing. All of these require uh, time and effort um, and also additional costs. So what are the cost estimating approaches? Well, there are two basic approaches. One is top-down approach and another is bottom-up. So the top-down approach uses historical data from similar engineering projects and it modifies original data for changes in inflation, activity level, weight, energy consumption, size, and other factors. And it's best used early in estimating process. A bottom-up approach is different. It's more detailed cost estimating method. It attempts to break down project into small, manageable units and estimate costs. Smaller unit costs added together with other types of costs to obtain overall cost estimate. So again, the top-down approach uh, is better used in the early estimation, but bottom-up is when more detailed designs are available. So um, that's important to realize that this is a big difference between the two approaches. So the cost estimating models that could be used are per unit model, also known as unit technique, segmenting model, cost indices, power sizing model, triangulation, and also improvement in the learning curve. So let's talk about per unit model. Per unit model, also known as unit techniques, it's used, uh, for example, in construction to determine construction cost per square foot. Um, in the building construction, also to uh, un figure out capital cost of power plant per kilowatt of capacity, um, or revenue and maintenance cost per mile of highway, utility cost per square foot of floor space, fuel cost per kilowatt generated, revenue per customer served. Uh, so here's an example of using this uh, unit model or per unit model. Uh, for example, we want to um, do a cost estimation of camping on an island for 24 students over 10 days. So we want to estimate the cost per student. We have certain plan activities. And then these include two days of canoeing, three day hikes, three days at the beach, and nightly entertainment. So here we have our cost data. We have a van. Uh, we would need a van uh, for capacity of 15. Um, and we're going to rent it 
and that's a $50 one way uh, rental of a van that can fit 15 students. Of course, keep in mind that we have 24 students. So obviously one van is not gonna be enough for 24 students. And then the camp is 50 miles away, van gets 10 miles per gallon, and gas is, um, let's say, $1 a gallon. Each cabin holds four campers, rent is $10 a day a cabin, and meals are $10 a day per camper. A boat transportation is $2 per camper, one way. Insurance grounds fees overhead is $1 per day per camper. And canoe, which um, has a capacity of three um, people, um, can be rented at $5 per day a canoe. And day hikes are $2.5 uh, camp per day. A beach rental is $25 of group for half a day. And nightly entertainment is free. So, again, we're going to break it down. Um, and so we assume that 100% participation of all the 24 students and all the activities that we mentioned. So here's our transportation cost. So the van, we need two vans because we have 24 students and one van can only fit 15 students. So we have two vans, we have two trips because it's a one, one way. So we need a round trip, so that's two trips. And then uh, $50 rental, so 50 times two times two, gonna come to 200. Similarly, gas, a um, dollar per gallon, 50 miles divided by 10 miles per gallon. And again, because we have two vans, two trips, uh, again, multiplying it by two, by two, if we get 20 dollars boat we have two dollars per camper trip multiplied by 24 campers multiplied by two uh, so that gives 96 so that's acceptable in terms of transportation cost we also have the cost of living so the living costs include meals and that's ten dollars uh, camper day we have 24 campers for 10 days so all together the meals uh, cost twenty four hundred dollars and then we have a cabin rental. Um, we pay $10 per day per cabin. A cabin can uh, hold only four campers. So we divide 24 campers by four. That's going to be six cabins that we need for 10 days. So again, 10 by 6 by 10 is 600. So that's our cabin rental cost. That's part of living costs. And another part of living costs is insurance. Um, so insurance is a dollar a day camper, 24 campers by 10 days. So we have 240. So now we can add up all the living costs and that comes to 3,240. So that's our subtotal for living costs. But we also have other costs, which are entertainment costs. So entertainment includes things like uh, beach hiking, um, and nightly entertainment, also canoe rental. So let's start with the canoe rental. Canoe is five dollars, uh, five five dollars per day per canoe. We have a canoe uh, capacity of three campers. So we have twenty four divided by three. We have we will need eight canoes. Uh, we have two two days of canoeing. So we have five by two by eight. That's gonna be eighty. We also have beach rental. We have $25 a group for half a day. And then we're going to have um, three days. So three multiplied by two half days. And so that leads us to $150. Um, another thing, we have a day hike. And day hike, we're going to do it over three days. And it costs $250 per camp per day. For 24 campers, again, multiply by three days, that comes to 180. And nightly entertainment is free. So adding up together, we have a subtotal cost of $410. So now we need to uh, add all of the subtotal costs for transportation, living costs, 
in entertainment, and it comes to this much, right? Which is three thousand nine hundred sixty-six. So that's our total cost. So from the total cost, we then divide the total cost of three. Uh, 3966 we divide by 24 and that will give us um, cost per student right so if we divide it by 24 so dividing the 3966 by 20 uh, by 24 we'll get the cost per student so next thing is we can talk about segmenting model so different uh, but similar uh, in the some type of way it's similar uh, you can actually use a segmenting model and that's used to estimate uh, something that can be decomposed into individual components uh, for example parts of equipment right if you're if you're building something uh, we can um, estimate each additional part each part of equipment separately and then add them up to a total cost right if we're building that equipment um, so again, estimates are made at the component level, and individual estimates are then aggregated back together, basically sums them up similar to how we summed up the cost for different in the per unit model in the different uh, subtotals. Um, so now let's take a look at the example where we're using segmenting model. So we want to estimate a cost of loan mower. And so we're building the lawn mower, mower. So we have different types, four different types of uh, uh, parts that include uh, that the lawn mower, mower is built of. So first part is uh, chassis, and they include deck, wheels, and axles. And this is estimates for each of the cost item, which adds up to the subtotal. We also have drivetrain. For drivetrain, we have items engine, starter assembly, transmission, drive disk assembly, clutch linkage, and belt assemblies. And these are detailed estimates for each uh, part corresponding to this, these parts of drivetrain. And when we add up all the parts of the drivetrain, we get the subtotal. We also have two more parts, right? Um, and so um, we have control components. Control components include handle assembly, engine linkage, blade linkage, speed control linkage, drive control assembly, and cutting height adjuster. So these are corresponding estimates for each of the this part right, of the controls. And so when we add them up together, we'll get the subtotal. And last but not least, we also have a cutting and collection system, and that includes the following parts, blade assembly, side chute, grass bag and adapter. And these are the estimates, right? This is for blades assembly, this is for side chute, and this is for, for grass bag and adapter. We add them together, we get the subtotal. So then we add all four subtotals that we got for A, B, C, and D components together. And this, these are the components, right? Subtotals. And this adds up to 173 dollars and 45 cents so that would be as um, a loan mower a build if you were to build a loan mower that would be our estimate estimated cost of the loan mower so now let's take a look at cost indices so cost indices is another important cost estimation um, model and the way it works it basically uses the information that is published um, by the U.S. federal government and specifically the Department of Commerce uh, Bureau of Statistics. And uh, the Statistical Abstract of the United States publishes cost indices for labor, construction, and materials. And the best known example is the Consumer Price Index known as CPI, and that's a really good measure of inflation. So the measure is scaled, so it doesn't have dollars um, or any kind of other uh, currency uh, attached to it. So it's, it's just the relative values of any two measures um, that are meaningful. For example, in 1920s, the measure was about 20, right? So again, no units attached, no dollars or anything. It's just a measure, right, that says 20 
for in terms of um, uh, consumer price index. In 1997, it was about 160. So the conclusion that we would um, make is that in 1997, we would spend 160 divided by 20 or eight times as much uh, as we would have spent in 1920 for the same consumables. Of course, you know, it's uh, a little bit of an assumption because what we purchase or consume in 97 or consumed in 97 is quite different from what people consumed in um, 1920. So cost indices work in the same way as the price indices, but it focuses on, rather than on general economy, it focuses on specific um, industry, example, labor, construction, materials, right, specific uh, type of um, uh, costs or consumables, right. And cost, cost indices are also dimensionless, so there is no dollars attached to it, they're dimensionless. So now let's take a look at this graph. And what it shows, it shows the cost indices, uh, specifically U.S. Urban uh, Consumer Price Index, in January of each year from 1916 to 2000. So you can see that at first it was varying uh, kind of moderately, and then there was a big spike in terms of increase, right? Very rapid inflation. Uh, starting somewhere in the mid uh, 70s. So cost indices reflect historical change in costs. And cost indices could be individual cost items, specifically labor, material, utilities, or they could be group of costs, consumer prices, producer prices. Indices can be used to update historical costs. And this is a formula that is very useful that connects the costs and indices. So the cost in year A um, is related to the cost in year B the same way as indices in year A is related um, to index in year B. So this ratio model um, that connects the costs with the indices is very, very useful because in order to estimate some cost in um, this this year, uh, based on some costs that we had, uh, say, five years ago, we just look up the index now compared to the index five years ago of, of um, those consumables, right, or groups of costs, depending on what, what this, uh, the cost represents. So let's take a look at the example of where we're using the cost indices. So labor cost now, for example, compared to labor cost 10 years ago, uh, we're just using the index for the labor cost, right? So it's not CPI, it's a, it's a labor cost index for now divided by 10 years ago. And so we plug plugging in the labor cost that we had 10 years ago, and then we multiply it by this ratio of the index now to the index 10 years ago, and this is the value we got. Here's another example with material cost. Material cost now versus material cost three years ago. So we have some data on what it cost us three years ago. Now we're going to do the similar project now. So we just multiply the material cost that we had before um, three years ago by the ratio of indexes now to three years ago. So plugging in the values, we'll get this. So now let's take a look at another model. So this power sizing model is when we have a, um, a, a um, effect of the, um, let's say, economy, um, how large, how large uh, something is, let's say, maybe we, we built a plant um, that could produce, you know, um, at the capacity of, say, 10,000 uh, units per day, but now we want to um, make a much larger plant because we got so much more demand, so we want to, produce, uh, to um, build a plant that would produce at the capacity of 50,000 units per day. 
Um, so again, it might be uh, it, what we want to do is we might want to adjust for for the size of the plants, you know, based on the data that we have for that smaller size. Um, now that we have a larger size, how how much the costs are gonna be? Um, so here's an example of a power sizing model. So not an example, but the, the um, formula. So basically, again, the cost A divided by cost B um, are related to the size um, A to, and size B, and there is a power sizing exponent X that is involved. Um, so it depends, right, whether it's more than one or less than one. Um, it depends whether it's it's uh, cheaper to build something smaller or cheaper to build something larger. And not not cheaper, but uh, if there's a scale, um, economy of scale kind of relationships. So X, as I mentioned before, is a power sizing exponent. So to make this a uh, little more um, clear, let's take a look at the example, right, of different exponents. So here, for different facilities or equipment uh, types, we have different power sizing exponent X. For example, if we were, were to do um, or build the blower, centrifugal blower, uh, the power sizing exponent would be 0 0.59. Um, for a compressor, it's 0 0.32. Um, so again, some economies of scale. Uh, but if you look at the centrifugal fan versus blower, right, the blower has a, a exponent that is smaller than one, um, but the fan has a uh, exponent that is larger than one, which means that it's, it's actually um, more expensive to build a larger fan. Or um, So this power size relationship um, it, it does depend on the type of equipment or facility. And again, here you, you can see again, we have filter, lagoon, motor, reactor as an example of different equipments and facilities. And then for different uh, items, we have different power size and um, exponents. And what's important to realize, right, is whether this exponent is more than one or, or less than one, because it makes a difference in, in this model. So now let's take a look at um, how to estimate um, benefits. So we have different benefits that we can consider. Example, sales of product, revenues from bridge tolls and electric power sale, cost reduction from reduced material or labor costs, less time spent in traffic jams, reduced risk of flooding, um, and very important to realize that um, there is a very large uncertainty in estimating benefits. It's even larger than estimating costs. Um, and it's typically asymmetric, which also was true for the cost as well. And, and there is a broader limit for negative outcomes, which means we tend to overestimate the benefits. Remember, if, if you will, that uh, when we talked about estimating costs, the um, broader limit was for positive outcomes, which meant that we uh, were tending to um, underestimate the cost. But in terms of the benefits, we tend to overestimate the benefits. Um, and so the, there is a broader limit for negative outcomes where the cost could be, um, or benefits could be uh, half of what we expected them to be. Um, so again, right? This this kind of depends also on, on the idea why why uh, there's even larger uncertainty in terms of estimating benefits versus cost. Is that we have more control over cost, um, while we have less control of whether whether you know the the benefits gonna realize uh, because there's other parties that involved in 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 terms of. Um, having the benefits. Example, right, if you're selling the product, um, maybe consumer is not going to be as um, excited about the product as we um, think it will, they, they will be. And so um, it's important to understand that there is even larger um, problem in terms of estimating the benefits, even uh, greater, greater risk of 
um, making incorrect estimates. Um, so that's basically to sum up uh, what I was trying to say is that benefits are more difficult to estimate the cost. Uh, for the most part, we can use exactly the same approach to estimating benefits as to estimating the cost. Um, so there are going to be fixed and variable benefits, uh, recurring and non-recurring, incremental benefits, life cycle benefits, rough, semi-detailed and detailed benefit estimates, the difficulties in estimation, is uh, uh, largely uh, similar, uh, but as I mentioned again, right, there's additional uncertainty in terms of how the other party um, that is often involved in realizing the benefits of whether they, they are really going to um, help us uh, realize those benefits. And then also we can use segmentation and index models um, or uh, some type of uh, uh, Mm, cost estimation models can also be used for certain type of benefits that are somewhat related um, to those uh, type of costs. Uh, so major differences between benefit and cost estimation. Costs are more likely to be underestimated, as I said, and benefits are more likely to be overestimated. Uh, benefits tend to occur further in the future than cost, and that's additional difficulty uh, because the further in the future they occur, the less, uh, the less uh, certain, right, the more uncertainty, you know, going to happen, the less certain we are, uh, because there are more things that could potentially go wrong. Uh, so now let's talk about a very important, uh, useful tool for solving engineering economy problems, and that's cash flow diagrams. And the cash flow diagrams is just a way to visualize um, the cost and benefits that occur over time. And it illustrates the size, the sign, and very importantly, timing of individual cash flows. And there are different components of cash flow diagrams, including the time axis. So we have a, time, a segmented time-based horizontal line divided into time units. We also have vertical errors representing cash flow and it's added at the time it occurs to that horizontal line. An error pointing down for cost, and we have error pointing go up for benefits. So here's an example of cash flow diagram. So we have these timings of cash flows. So at time zero right now, uh, we receive $100. Uh, one time period from today, we have to pay $100. So that would be negative. Two time periods from today, uh, for example, two days from today, right, or two months from today, we again receive a hundred dollars, so it's positive the uh, hundred. And then three times from today, we're gonna pay a hundred fifty, so that's a negative hundred fifty. And then again, four time periods from today, we have negative hundred fifty, and then positive hundred fifty five time periods from today. So if we were to plot this, we would first start with drawing a horizontal line. And because we have five time periods, we would split it into six intervals, starting with zero, which is time, time now, then one time period from today, two, three, four, five. These time periods could be anything. It could be either a day or a month or a week, right, or a year, whatever is, uh, um, relevant in terms of the problems that we are considering. And now we have these cash flows. So positive, right, which is in, in uh, baby blue, right? So it's going to be going up and it's going to be a size of $100, right? So oops, uh, go back to the line, right? So now we have this positive 100. Then we have negative 101 time period from today. So it's one, we're going to have an uh, arrow pointing down. And then what do we have two times from today? Yes, we have error pointing up, just the same as those other two, right, in terms of the length. Oh, sorry. And then we have three times from today a negative 150, right? We are paying 150. So is it going to be up or down? Yes, you're right. It's going to be down. So we have this orange down. But notice that if before... We had the same size errors. Now this length is more, right? It's it's this 
the length of this one, this arrow, is uh, one and a half times larger than the other ones. And then we also have four time periods from today. We have negative 150. So at four, we have arrow pointing down. It's the same as at times three. And then positive 50, five times from today. So a smaller error, about half of the length of errors that we have at zero and two, uh, at five pointing up. Very good. So this is a cash flow diagram. So why is this is important? Because it will help us uh, see the structure in cash flows. So drawing cash flow diagram is a very important way to visualize um, and summarize the available cash flows or, or uh, estimated cash flows to understand whether there's any structure in cash flows because for different structures of cash flows we would use different formulas. So again, I can't underestimate the importance of drawing cash flow diagrams every time you start solving a problem. So what are the categories of cash flows? Of course, first cost, and these are expenses to build or buy and install. And often they're at time now, but sometimes they're uh, a little further um, in addition to time now. Um, then there's also operation and maintenance costs. And these are annual expenses such as electricity, labor, and, and minor repairs, right? So these are often um, some recurrent costs. We have salvage value. Salvage value is a receipt at project termination for sale or transfer of the equipment. And that's you usually see at the end um, of the timeline, somewhere at the end of your project. Um, we also have revenues, and revenues, right, um, they often have this recurrent, um, recurrent nature to them, so they're usually annual receipts due to scale, due, due to sale of products or services, so you would usually look at them as, as these positive errors going up. Um, so last but not least, there could be some overhaul, and an overhaul is major capital expenditures that occurs during the asset's life. Um, and so they're not the first cost, um, so they're not going to be at time zero, but sometimes later, uh, somewhere in the middle of the, uh, of the timeline, you might see some kind of, and by middle, I don't mean exactly the middle of it, uh, but somewhere, somewhere um, between the beginning uh, or time now and the end of the project. And that's a major, major, major capital expenditure that occurs during the asset's life. So now that we know the categories of cash flows, uh, let's draw a cash flow uh, diagram. Um, so to, to draw a cash flow diagram, uh, you need to understand when all cash flows occur. In a cash flow diagram, the end of period T is the same time as the beginning of period T plus 1. And that is a very, very important assumption. Um, and then rent lease and insurance payments are usually treated as the beginning of the period cash flows. So that's important to remember. These are beginning of the uh, period cash flows. So if you're paying a rent for the first month, it will actually occur at time zero rather than at time one. At time one, you will still pay rent, but it will be for month two. Um, on the other hand, the operation and maintenance costs, salvage, revenues, and overhauls are assumed to be end of period cash flows. And this is very important because if you don't remember this, you will draw cash flows incorrectly. So once again, the rent lease and insurance are beginning of the period cash flows. So the operations and maintenance, salvage, revenues, and overhauls are end of a period cash flows. And that's, that's assumptions for cash flow diagrams. And the choice of time, the zero, is arbitrary. So it's up to you to uh, think when, when is your time now. So you can also draw the cash flow diagram in the spreadsheet. Um, so if you have these costs, so you can see capital costs. Uh, so at time zero, you have some kind of installation uh, costs of 80,000. 
and then you have operation and man uh, maintenance cost of 12,000 at each year, year one, two, three, four, five, and six. And you have some additional capital costs at time 10, and that's um, your salvage value. So whatever your installa installed um, things that you had, uh, you might sell it and get a uh, benefit of 10,000 on a receipt back to 10,000. And um, not just these um, are operations and maintenance costs, they're in the brackets. Well, the capital costs, uh, here we have a negative. Well, this brackets also mean that this is actually a cost, there are negative cash flows. And this overhaul during year three, somewhere in, be in, in between, um, the beginning and the end of the project, right, is, a, is this negative cost of 25000 So if we were to plot this, we would need a timeline that has um, seven, seven um, points, right, starting with zero, time now, end of year one, end of year two, end of year three, four, five, and end of year six. So these would represent our uh, end of years, right? And so you have this cash flow pointing down, right? This is pointing down here. Um, even though it's not an error, but using a spreadsheet, right? We're just uh, looking at this um, bar, right? So bar going down. Um, and these bars going down as well of equal size represent this 12,000 operations and maintenance. Um, and then this additional uh, overhaul on top of the 12,000 during year three, there's additional 25,000 uh, uh, overhaul bar, right, again pointing down. And then there's this uh, 10,000 pointing up bar of capital cost, right, that we are getting back in terms of the salvage value from this initial uh, capital cost. Uh, so again, now, right, this is a cash flow diagram um, drawn in spreadsheet. Here's another example. Two summer camps have the following data for a 12-week session. Uh, so camp A uh, charge per camper uh, 12 uh, not 12, uh, $120 uh, per week. Fixed cost of 48000 per session, variable cost per camper of $80 per week, and the capacity of uh, 200 campers. And there is a camp B. Um, they have a charge per camper of 10, uh, 100 um, per week. Fixed cost of 60600 per session. Um, variable cost per camper 50 per week, and capacity of 150 campers. So that's a 12 week, 12 week session. So again, that would be if you draw the cash flow diagrams, we would need to start with zero and then have for each week, we would have a point. Uh, so we would have a, a total of 13 time points, right? For time now, plus 12 points for each week. So develop the equations for total cost and total revenue for camp A. So to, do, to get the total cost, we're including the fixed cost plus the variable cost, right? And the revenue is what we can charge per camper. So what is the total number of campers that will allow camp B to break even? What is the profit or loss for the 12 week session if camp A operates at 80% capacity, right? So assuming that rather than having all 200 campers, what if we only had um, 200 multiplied by 0 0.8, which is um, 160 campers, would give us a profit or a loss. And also determine the break-even number of campers for the two camps um, to have equal total cost for a 12-week session. So go ahead and um, get started thinking about this example. Well, cash flow diagrams uh, can summarize the cost and benefits of the two projects, and the cash flow 
diagram also illustrates the size, sign, and timing of individual cash flows. Periods may be months, quarters, years, etc. So here is an example of a cash flow diagram with five time periods. So, and this is the size um, and the sign, uh, and as well as the timing of the cash flows. So if we draw the timeline, we would need six points here. And then we can uh, have different cash flows represent the year. So if you're receiving 100 at zero, it's a positive cash flow, so error going up. This is error going down when we pay 100 um, at time one. Then at time two, we again have positive cash flow of 100. Then we have at time three, we have negative cash flow, and also at time four, we have a negative cash flow of 150. And finally, positive cash flow of 50. And so this again, right, this is today, this is going to be tomorrow, right? So each day you will get, so this is the second day, the day after tomorrow, and so on. Important comment is the end of one period is the beginning of the next one. The errors point up for revenues or benefits down for costs, and one person's payment cash flow um, with negative signs is another person's receipt cash inflow with positive sign. So it's essential to only use a single perspective in any cash flow diagram. So you can't really switch between perspectives then you'll get the signs mixed and your whole analysis will be incorrect. So keep in, in mind that you can only look from one perspective. If you're assuming this borrower's perspective, then that's how you're looking at it. If you're looking at the uh, perspective of the person that's receiving something, then next time you're still using the perspective of that person and so on. All right, this completes um, this part two of lecture two.